All right, guys, it is 38 degrees in the bluegrass, and that makes for awesome dog training weather. We're out here with my little friend, Claire, and we're just going for a walk. Uh, Claire, like a lot of dogs that come here, uh, is a, a great little Labrador retriever that's going to be a house dog that goes hunting sometimes, right? Okay, and that's very important that you understand the distinction between a hunting dog, a dedicated hunting dog, and a house dog that goes hunting sometimes. People email me all the time and ask me, hey, Stoney, where can I get a good hunting dog? So I send them back his questionnaire about their lifestyle. And uh, then when I get those answers, 99% of the time, they don't really want a hunting dog. They want a house dog that can go hunting with them sometimes, right? And there's a big distinction, right? If you save up your vacation days and your money so that you can go hunting one or two weeks out of the year and your dog is going to soccer games and uh, neighborhood barbecues, the other 50 weeks of the year, you have a house dog that goes hunting sometimes. Okay, and it's super important when you go to choosing a dog to make sure that you choose the right dog for your particular lifestyle. Okay, and that's what we do here a lot. We get these little dogs in like Claire. Oh, he's a very cute dog. Oh, he's a very cute dog. And uh, you know, it's just a guy, he's uh, the king of sausage making in Aurora, Illinois. <laughs> uh, but he's got this good little dog and he wants to take her places and do stuff with her. And uh, you know, he's like, hey, Tony, and I, I don't go hunting a lot, but, but uh, I'd like to take this dog with me when, uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I go fishing or maybe you know, take a few hunting trips every once in a while. Uh, can you help me out with that? And uh, I'm like, well, sure, yeah, bring it on down. And Eli and I will, will, will get her ready for that. So how do, we, how do we go about training a house dog that goes hunting sometimes? It's really very similar to how we train every other dog. It's just a few specific skills that we work on in addition to our basic socialization, right? And uh, our basic skill set. So, you know, how do we look at socializing dogs? Well, you know, we are big, big, big proponents of proper environmental socialization. So we break our socialization scheme down into, you know, kind of really basically three parts, right? We have environmental socialization. We have interspecies socialization. That's where the dog is socializing, learning to get along with other dogs. And then we have intraspecies socialization. And that's where we take the dog and put them around other things. Like you guys have seen my goats, my pig and stuff in other videos. And uh, so we're trying to give the dog uh, kind of a, a good overview of all the different things that might come in contact uh, with in life. And, and, and so that starts with coming out here and just going for a walk, you know, with these dogs like this. And I've got a few others over there waiting to come out here. I just grab my shotgun and I start, I take off walking. And so we have these paths that are mowed uh, in my backfield. And so, you know, for the, for the dogs that are just here, Guys, this is something that you just don't think about. I talk about this in almost every video, but this can be a little daunting for a dog. This, see that all these weeds are up over her head, right? Like uh, that can be, that can be kind of daunting. And so it, it takes, it takes some exposure. You know, you can sit and work in your, work in your suburbs on fetching and stuff all, all you want. You can even put your dog in your swimming pool. Being in a swimming pool is not like being in a river. Fetching on the golf course is not like fetching in uh, this kind of uh, scrub brush here. Okay, so I grab my shotgun. Dog sees a shotgun. It says, hey, Stoney, what's that? And I say, that right there is a sign that we're going to go out in the real world and do some exploring. We're going to go have some adventure time. And the dog says, uh, okay. So then we start off. We come out here in the backfield and we take off walking. So what's going on? I'm here. The dog's here. Shotgun's here. I got my whistle here. So I'll start to introduce the concept of coming to my whistle because I need this dog to be able to come, you know, when she gets out here in this brush and maybe can't hear me or see me. And I'll move her around. Just, just let her know. She hears that whistle. Hey, start looking for Stoney because he's fixing to go somewhere. And uh, so, you know, we get pretty good at, uh, at being out here on just the, the low cut grass. And then I'm just going to start to play that same game, but I'm going to play the game into the brush. Oh, come on. Come on, dog. Very nice. Okay, and you see Claire, she falls right in here. She doesn't care about this brush. She's not worried too much. And we're just playing a little game, follow me around, have fun, don't, you know, smell all the different smells, feel all the different things there are to feel in this brush, you know, learn about the sticker bushes and stay away from those things. And we'll kick up a rabbit in here. There's all kinds of little stuff. There's a deer, a little, a, a little place where deer lay up over there. We're liable to kick up a deer in this video. And that's cool. 
And Claire responds to that perfectly because her breeder did a good job of producing a litter of puppies that fit into a house dog that go hunting sometimes scenario. So when people email me, you know, that's the first thing I ask them. I say, look, you know, what do you really want out of your dog? And we're talking about hunting dogs right now, or house dogs that go hunting sometimes. But this is true with everything. People email me and ask me about these Malinois, protection dogs, things like that. They'll say, hey, Stoney, where can I get a good one? But see, a good one is a matter of definition, right? So every breeder, you know, they think that uh, the litters that they're producing are the good ones. Right? So it's, it's not that like you, you get a dog and it doesn't fit into your lifestyle, it means it's a bad dog. It just means that maybe it wasn't the perfect fit for your lifestyle because you didn't do a good job of sitting down and objectively evaluating you know, what, uh, what you actually need and want. Okay? So when you go to thinking about getting a hunting dog, or in, in, in the case of the people that I see, a house dog that goes hunting, you need to sit down and you look at your lifestyle. You know, how much do you work? What kind of access to uh, outside areas, exercise areas do you have? How many members of your family are going to help with the training process and the management process, the exercise? <clears throat> are you getting married soon? Are you getting divorced soon? Are you having little kids? Do you have kids that are going off to college? Are you going to be changing jobs? When you change jobs, are you going to have to go from a rural area to a suburban area? Those are all things that you really have to sit down and put a pencil to when you go to choosing a dog that's going to sometimes go hunting, right? I mean, if you're moving out to Wyoming for your work and you've got a 15-year you know, a contract, the company's not going anywhere, yeah, listen. When you contact breeders, tell them, say, look, I'm, I'm moving to Wyoming and uh, my house is in, is in the middle of, 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 of 70,000 acres of, of, of perfect hunting land. All right, well, the, the breeder's going to tell you whether they have a dog that's suited for that or not. But you got to tell them too. You can call them and you say, hey, listen, I live in Wyoming and I live in the middle of 70,000 acres of awesome hunting ground. Do you have a dog for me? And the breeder will say, yeah, I got perfect dog for you. But you neglect to tell the breeder that next year you might get transferred to Washington, D.C. and live in a suburb, maybe in a townhouse, and have to exercise your dog in the park. Okay? So it's very important that you take an objective snapshot of your life as it is now right and tell that talk to your breeder about that but it's also just as important to you know kind of go through the machinations of where your life could be next year and the year after and the year after because getting a dog it's not all not, it's not about this year it's about the next 15 years okay so back to walking around with claire here i'm gonna go back out here in the grass because i don't want to fall down and i'm gonna call her and she's gonna come and i'm gonna say hey, i appreciate it and then we're going to take off walking. Now, one of the things you'll notice on this particular walk is uh, that I got this, this uh, marker on me, this clicker. And the reason I put that on this morning is because I did a couple of little videos where, uh, you know, I've been teaching Eli about marker training. And I did a couple of videos. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people have asked me, they say, hey, Stoney, what about that clicker? I, you know, I, I thought like the clicker training wasn't effective. I thought that it, you couldn't get reliability with it. Um, what, let me tell you what, these, what, what you can really do. You can take, and if you'll be open-minded, you can like, get you some old books about raising hunting dogs and raising dogs in general. And then get you some new books or new videos about uh, this stuff like marker training. Right? And just in your training journal, like write down the parts of those things that like, stick out to you that, you've, you know, that seem like something that would be fun to try. Go out and try it and see what works. And when you come back in and you journal the results of that particular approach to your, 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 your training session, if you have good results with it, hey, circle it. Do it again tomorrow, okay? Everything in your dog training experience should really be based on empirical research. And what I mean by empirical research is you gotta get out and you have to try things. And let your common sense dictate whether or not something seems like a good idea. Okay, like when I was young, what they would say about dog training is like uh, <clears throat> dogs, other dogs don't teach dogs what to do. They teach them what not to do, right? And uh, that was a very valid, listen, that's a very valid strategy for training dogs. Like if this dog jumps on me, you know, I can correct it and the dog learns. Hey, if I jump on Stony, bad things happen. <clears throat> now, some people, they were ham-handed with those techniques and, you know, maybe it kind of started to look bad. And then come, uh, comes along this, this idea that, well, Stony, if you 
teach the dogs to do the right thing, then they just won't be doing the wrong things. You know, that's it. They're just not doing the wrong thing. And that's, that's true too, most of the time. And there's no reason that you can't hold both of those views simultaneously. You know, there's a certain amount of synergism that you can get by thinking in terms of using uh, exercise and structured positive reinforcement activity to shape your dog's day in such a way that they are, you know, tired, so they don't have a lot of displacement energy to put into chewing and jumping and carrying on. But they, but, but, and, and they're also, you know, they're busy doing the right thing, so they can't be doing the wrong thing. Uh, but hold in your mind, uh, you know, a little section that says it's okay to use uh, a little bit of uh, physical intervention if the dog's engaging in behavior that is dangerous, destructive, or rude. You know, like I'm out here on this walk and I really want this dog just to walk with me and have a good time. But at some point she might start to get something uh, that I don't want her to get. You know, if she starts to get something that I don't want her to get, then I'm going to have to step in. You know, I can't, uh, I, I can't let her put herself in danger. You know, we have a, uh, <clears throat> we have a creek back here and uh, yeah, there's a couple of spots in that creek where the bank is really, uh, really steep and there's a lot of rocks at the bottom. And uh, so when we go over and we go close, I want to teach her, hey, you know, think about what you're doing. You know, where you're at on this creek, you could get hurt. And I don't want to let the dog get hurt to teach her that lesson. So, you know, I step in and I, I physically intervene. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that while we're on our walk, I can't use some of these uh, other methods to say, hey, that's a great place to put your feet. That's a great place for you to position your body. That's a great way for you to hold uh, uh, your position uh, in this field relative to my position in this field. And so, you know, we, thinking about what we're doing, we get the right dog. Most important thing in the world, get the right dog. And then you go out and you start living your life. And as you're living your life, you're telling the dog, hey, this is the kind of things we're gonna do and when the dog makes decisions that you would like to see again, if you would like to use marker training, you go, hey, I like the decision you just made. There you go. And what's going on with this clicker? Nothing. It's a way to keep me disciplined and it's a way for me to provide information to this dog in a very precise manner. Okay, that's all it is. And it's cool, you know, it's really cool. Do you need it? Nope, nope. But uh, is it fun to fool with? It's super fun. Your whistles, you know, do you need whistles? No, you don't need a whistle. But, uh, you know, why not use it? People have been using them for years. Uh, they're awesome. And believe me, like, look, dogs respond to whistles. I mean, why do they use whistles in sports? Why do the traffic cops use whistles? Whistles are great ways to communicate with the dog. So what's your clicker? A way to communicate that the puppy's doing the right thing. What's a whistle? It's a way to, you know, get the dog's attention and either tell them that they need to stop doing something, which is a long single blast whistle, uh, or to tell them that they need to start doing something, like come to you. So I'm here. Okay, so I can do it like that with the whistle. I can do the same thing, and I can throw in this clicker. Oh, what a good dog. Now I wait, click, there we go. I can do it that way, or look, I can do it the old fashioned way. Come on, come on, come on, come on. No, sit. I can use body pressure. You see that, that forward body pressure that I put on the dog, right? Just told her, I said, hey, look, you need to sit down right now because I told you to. I'm going to be fair, firm, fair, and consistent with you, but when I tell you to do something, you have to do it. Okay, that, and that works great. It works. It, it works fantastic, guys. I mean, a lot of dogs have been trained that way. There's probably been more, <laughs> there's been more good kids and more good dogs raised uh, by firm, fair, and consistent disciplinarians than uh, any other strategy, right? I mean, it, and so if you just want to be honest about it, like that, if, if you judge things on a historical level, that old fashioned way of dog training, it's the most successful. You know, sheer numbers wise, it's the most successful. So, why do we do things differently now? I do things differently because uh, I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. You know, I like to do the food work. I like to get out and move around. I like to keep the dog busy doing the right thing so they're not doing the wrong thing, you know. But does that mean that I've taken and thrown all those old-fashioned techniques under the bus? No way. 
I keep them all in reserve, and a lot of people pay me to teach them those traditional techniques. So um, I have a giant toolbox, and in that toolbox is every dog training technique you could think of. Just because I have my favorites doesn't mean I'm going to push my favorites on all my clients. I'm going to tell them what I would like to do, and I'm going to say, hey, would you like to do that? And they're either going to say yes or no. If they say no, I say, well, okay, let me, let me provide an alternate strategy and an alternate set of techniques for you. How does this work for you? And if that works, that's what we roll with. If that doesn't work, then I keep digging through that toolbox until I find something that works for that particular situation. Because ultimately, the best dog training is the dog training that gets done. That's it. It's just that simple, right? It's just that simple. Whatever dog training will get done consistently and with persistence at your home is going to work best. A great method, a great strategy and technique selection, but uh, implemented poorly is it's not it's, 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 it's not work I would rather have a subpar strategy and technique selection that's implemented with consistency and persistence right okay because remember ultimately as long as you'll be firm fair and consistent you're gonna end up with an awesome dog oh what a good dog very nice Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Back to walking. Ah. Finish our walk, and then we'll go up to the exercise of small challenges course. We'll work on te teaching our basic vocabulary, and we'll do a little fetching. Oh, again, using a combination of uh, kind of new fun stuff for you guys to work on, and uh, you know, just some old fashioned approaches. Dun, dun, just walking. So I'm gonna walk on my pass a little bit. Just let Claire smell around. Ah, get used to, like right here, it's a briar bush, you know? Something dogs really gotta learn to get aware of when they're young. Dun, 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 dun. Come on over here. Now you notice, like when I'm walking, I try to walk with purpose. Right, I'm not turned around begging my dog to come with me all the time. What I'm trying to be here is I'm trying to be the kind of leader that goes out and has fun and the dogs want to follow around. You know, I don't want to be like out here trying to micromanage them. I'm not going to be out here like trying to make sure that they don't step on a stall or get themselves in trouble somehow. I want them kind of to get out here and get lost a bit, have to try to come find me. You know, I'm out here. Come on, find me. You can find me. Very nice. And you'll see how she's having to jump up like that, you know. And uh, she's learning how to negotiate all this different brush. Good. Very nice. Dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Try to walk in such a way that Eli doesn't end up falling down. He's already got a broken hand. I don't even have a broken leg, too. Dun dun. Dun, 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 go back this way, Eli. There you go. Now, see, oh, there's Claire. Hello. And you see how she's just falling in with me. Now, look, guys, I'm not, I'm not bossing her. I'm not micromanaging her behavior. We're just out here going for a walk. And uh, whenever she does something that I like, I'm telling her, hey, I appreciate it. Do I, do I have to do this with the, you know how I'm rewarding her here? Do I have to? No. No, just, you just bring a dog out here, go for a walk, and they'll self-regulate, you know? I mean, I know a whole bunch of guys, they raise these dogs, they never give them treats like I do. They come over close, they'll reach down and talk to them, pet them a little bit. That works fine. You know, I just like to do things the way I like to do things. And if you want to, like, you know, if you want to explore something that's kind of fun, there's so many videos and books on marker training that... Like, you can uh, throw that into your training experimentation, you know, and it's going to be, it, it'll be a lot of fun for you, you know. Uh, I was really, I've been surprised at exactly how much feedback that I was getting <laughs> just because, uh, you know, I was letting a dog follow a stick around with his nose. <laughs> but whatever. Oh, that's a good dog. Like, see right here, she's making a little effort. So the marker trainer people would be like, oh, hey, I appreciate that effort. And they'd reach down there and they'd give her a treat for the effort. And then, uh, you know, every day when I come back here, like I would ask her to make a little bit more effort. 
makes a little bit more effort, I say, hey, I appreciate it. And then after a, you know, a few weeks of doing this, like you come out here, she just hops right up on the brush pile with you. It's uh, pretty simple stuff. Now, uh, marker training by itself, uh, you gotta be really, really patient. You know, so do I think that for the average fella that uh, has a house dog that, you know, he's uh, wanting to take hunting sometimes, do I think it's a viable uh, primary training strategy? No, I don't. I don't. I think you need to, you know, lay your obedience patterns early. Uh, and I think you need to do a lot of adventure training, a lot of environmental socialization like what I'm doing right now. Uh, and then come in with your marker, marker training on a secondary or tertiary level, like second or third level. You know, uh, but is it nice? Yeah, like, you know, when you go out to eat, obviously, what are you going to get? This is America. You're going to get you a big hunk of beef and a big Idaho potato, right? I mean, that's, 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 that's the meal. A big slice of beef and a big Idaho potato. But it's nice to have a little bit of green beans, a little bit of asparagus, some cooked apples with that, right? So that's how you look at your market training. And if you're me, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of dessert, a little bit of that cream brulee or whatever they call it. All right, so I'm going to get off here. Very nice, we can go back for a walk. Come on, dog. And this is really, you know, this is really the dog training that you need to do, guys. Just get out, get moving with your dog. Now, we're gonna go back up to my exercise with small challenges course. And uh, since we've, we've come out here and we've had a good time, the dog's got to smell a lot of things. The dog's got to like uh, have a lot of what we call toes to nose stimulation. It's got to smell, it's got to touch, it's got to feel, it's got to experience temperature differentials, okay? Since all of those things are happening, now see if I wanna do marker training here, appreciate it. Since all of those things are happening, now that excess energy that a puppy has in the morning, sometimes it gets in the way of learning, like, you know, like I was talking about last week about kids going to school and they need a little bit of recess before school. That's kind of what we've done here, you know? And so now we're gonna head back and we're gonna to get to our formal training. So this is the informal part of our morning. Now we're gonna go back and do a little formal training uh, as it relates to raising a house dog that goes hunting sometimes. All right, now we're back up the small challenges course. So we took a walk in the morning, right? So again, getting back to the idea of the right dog, uh, <laughs> think about this, this is a simple way to think about it. How long a walk do you want to take in the morning? Because <laughs> you want your dog to be able to get most of its morning energy out on your normal morning walk, okay? So if you don't want to take a very long walk in the morning, then you need to buy a dog from a breeder who produces uh, litters that can be exercised within the parameters of the time and effort level that you can allocate to that activity, okay? Just that simple. So if you're a marathon runner, well, then you can <laughs> have a lot more athletic, high, ener high, high energy, high endurance, quick re recharge rate dog, right? And uh, if you're the kind of guy that doesn't like to walk very far, well, then you need to get a kind of a lower energy dog. So uh, we knocked out a little bit of uh, walking and exploring or what we call environmental socialization, right? We did a few recalls while we were on our walk. That's super fun. Uh, we let Claire, uh, you know, uh, uh, work on toes to nose stimulation, right? In other words, getting her body to where it works good, proprioception, all that good stuff. Now we're going to come up and we're going to work on our basic vocabulary. Now you can do this, again, you can do it a couple of different ways, guys. It all works if you do it with consistency and persistence, right? So let's just, let's just do it with the leash, okay? No treats, no anything. Come on, up. Very nice. You're a very good dog. Easy. And, you know, these are the words I like to use. You don't have to use these words. You can use whatever words you like. Good dog. But I kind of want to make sure that the dog has, uh, you know, just a, a good set of basic <coughs> uh, uh, vocabulary words that make it easy for me to navigate my day with them. Now, Claire's about 16 weeks old, 17 weeks old. I get them excited every day. Very nice. So I can calm them down. Easy. Very nice. Wait. And just with a simple slip lead, you know, you can train a dog perfectly fine. Again, you just have to be firm, fair, and consistent when you're doing these traditional uh, styles. Very nice. Oh, watch your feet. Good. Oh, and you know, sometimes, like, uh, sometimes I forget to how important this is, auditory socialization. The reason we have these barrels, not only because they're kind of slick, but if it, that's, that's kind of like what one of them aluminum John boats sounds like when you're in it. And so when we're here, we're, that's why we use these barrels, these particular barrels, if you're ever wondering. But auditory, 
uh, socialization is very important. I mean, that falls into the, under the auspices of, of, of environmental socialization, but I don't always do a good job of reminding people about dogs need to learn how to hear stuff and not get upset. Like, so when you're doing hunting dogs, you think in terms of exposing them to, to uh, gunfire when they're young. I tell you, though, more than one time, I've gotten an email where a perfectly, oh, did you fall down? Come on. Where a perfectly, uh, you know, like well acclimated house dog has, uh, you know, the owners have come home and the dogs have torn up the house. And they'll email me and they go, they, I just don't understand it. One of the first questions I ever ask in those situations is, uh, is there any construction next door? Okay, because like you can have a perfectly good dog, or oh, like little Claire here, very, very nice. Uh, you can have a perfectly good dog, that's it and uh, somebody's putting a new roof on their house next door and they're using nail guns all day, drive them crazy, you know? And so uh, again, it's important when a dog's young, don't train uh, based on just what's going on right then. You know, train keeping the, the, the whole universe of possibilities Let's in mind. Our little targeting stick here, and uh, we'll do it a little differently. Come on. So what's going on here? You know, me and Claire are just playing a game where she's trying to touch the end of the stick with her nose and there are some environmental impediments in the way and she has to negotiate those environmental impediments to get to her goal which is you know following the stick around and what my goal is is to get her to fo follow the stick around in such a way that she identifies patterns that uh, i would like to see again and when she starts to identify those patterns she will break those down and uh, i'll have the ability to communicate with my dog that's very precise and uh, it's easy to control the speed and effort level at which it's given. Up, so I can get real excited. Oh my gosh. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, easy. Wait. <laughs> Super fun. Now, you know, do you need to do it? Nope. Nope. You can just do it the other way. It's fine. There's no reason to do it this way at all. But maybe you want to do it. Maybe it's fun. Maybe you got a few extra minutes every morning this week. Okay. Something fun to work on, right? And uh, I tell you, I, well, okay, let me, let me take her over here and finish out this routine part of our deal. And I'm gonna show you someplace that this really, 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 really falls, uh, but it really becomes useful. Oh, very nice, come on. And that's in the fetching. Oh my gosh. One of the most common problems that dog trainers here, go over this way a little bit, Eli, so they can see her sit so pretty. Um, one of the most common uh, problems that dog trainers hear about is like fetching problems, you know, because you get home from work and you just got a few minutes and you're trying to get the dog to fetch and the dog just takes the, the item and it runs off and, and lays under the shade bush or it runs off and tries to get you to chase it or it comes back but it won't bring it all the way to you. Oh, that's a good dog, Claire. Well, uh, th tell you what, this right here can go a long way towards helping you like get the dog to fetch in the proper manner you know because one of the things that, that happens to dog trainers amateur or professional uh, when something doesn't go right you'll show frustration all over your face and in your posture and in your vocal inflection so like if you throw something and you're trying to you know what you're trying to convince the dog of is if they'll run out there and get it and come back you're going to be happy oh go get it oh you're such a good dog but what happens is they go out and they get it and they're kind of goofing off with it or they won't bring it all the way back and you'll end up going come come here bring that here well nobody wants to come to that Right? Nobody wants to come to that. Puppies, children, wives, whatever. Nobody wants to come to that. So you got to learn to chill and make sure that when you're presenting fetching, you're presenting uh, the bringing of the item back as a mutually beneficial exchange. In other words, if the dog brings the item back to you, then you'll do something for the dog. So let's go over here and look at that. Okay, so now what I was saying about fetching, guys, is a lot of times when you're talking, you will inadvertently show the frustration through uh, your vocal inflection. Clicker takes all that away. So like, let, we've got Claire here and... Uh, uh, <clears throat> You can start this in your hallway or whatever. Of course, I started her in the fetching pen, but she's doing pretty good. So let me kind of show you, uh, you know, how we approach uh, fetching using this clicker to help us. So here's our little toy. She's going to go get it. And when she brings it back, right as soon as she gets all the way over here to me, I'm going to click, treat, oh my gosh, release. Right, and then she's kind of hanging around, and I'm going to throw it. Not far, because the only thing I'm trying to teach her here is that picking that up and handing it to me is a mutually beneficial exchange. Not only do I give her a treat, okay, for doing it, which is not just about the treat. Remember, guys, the treat is a physical manifestation of my pleasure, okay, but I'm also going to throw the dummy for her again, right? So it's a real fun trade. She goes and gets something, she gives it to me, something good happens to her, then we get to have fun again. 
and like three to five reps, three to five times a day, next thing you know, you know, all your frustration's gone, you got a smile on your face, your posture is, is projecting positivity, your vocal inflection is projecting uh, positivity, and you've got a little puppy that's, uh, you know, got good retrieving in, in, in the yard, and then you can start to expand your retrieving into more and more distracting environments. That's just a win-win situation. Come on, Ranger! All right, George, so what we're going to do here is we're going to go down here to our nut and fancy uh, inspired uh, shooting stage and uh, we're going to work on this dog waiting patiently while I play fetch with the other dog. Now the effect that's going to have not only to reinforce the idea that she has to have good field etiquette, good manners, but also it's going to make her a little bit jealous uh, of what the other dog's getting to do and it's going to build her drive towards the activity. Does that make sense? Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk up through here and I'm going to work on rangers fetching and uh, then we'll come back through here and I'll put you up here as a stationed gunner and uh, we're going to work on Ranger sitting still uh, and shooting, and we're going to work on her becoming acclimated to the gunfire. Sound like a good plan? Yeah. All right. Give me that dummy. Ranger! Oh, what a good boy. Now, every so often, whenever she's being calm and attentive and seeming to accept the fact that I'm playing more with Ranger, then you're going to give her a treat. But don't give her too many treats because she's got a lot of running to do. Ranger, come on, buddy. Oh, we'll throw a little bit of marker training in here with Ranger. Oh my gosh, what a good boy, Ranger! You're such a smarty! Oh, you're a good dog, Ranger! <laughs> oh, very nice. Now, Ranger is here specifically because he has a bad tendency uh, of getting, like, really having to go to pieces when he gets into high distraction environments. He, uh, He's great in the house. His owner's done a lot of food work with him and stuff. He's real reliable in the house, real reliable in uh, the garage. But when he goes to a park, like this dog, you know, he'd fetch a hundred times in the hallway. But as soon as you go outside, he just gets off chasing butterflies and chasing other birds. And even out here, even with just that little bit of competition that that little chocolate lab is providing, you're going to notice that he doesn't want to bring that dummy back down here uh, since we're going towards that little puppy. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of crazy. All you can do, though, is be patient and persistent and consistent. Oh, my gosh. What a good boy. What a good boy. Oh. Throw that click, treat, and release in. Make sure that he looks at fetching as uh, something that's mutually beneficial. It's good for him, and it's good for me both. Oh, what you think, Ranger? Is it good for both of us? Oh, very nice, Ranger. Oh, that's a very smart dog. Oh my gosh, oh, see right there, he didn't want to give it to me, but maybe if I move backwards, oh, then we'll get a click, treat, and release based on mutually beneficial exchange. I'm going to turn this dog into a good little libertarian. Oh, what a good fella. Now, simultaneously, what we're doing here is, uh, you know, that little dog down there, she knows I'm up here fetching with Ranger. And it makes her a little jealous, you know. Now, <laughs> I know somebody in the comments is going to say, well, Stoney, now listen, jealousy is not an actual emotional state. It is. It's good enough, right? I'm telling you, when you do something with another dog, it makes that the, the, the dog that's not getting to do it want to do it more. Uh, you know, some people call them retrieving denials. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways of describing it, but it works. There's no kidding. I mean, I do it every day. So we got Ranger. And I'll throw his dummy for him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe throw in my whistle. Oh, click, treat. Okay, release. Very nice. Now we'll do this a little while. And uh, you can't see it right now, but that puppy, it's getting up sometimes. And when it gets up, George, he doesn't really fuss at it or anything. He just, you know, ignores it. And then when the puppy sets back down, George puts a count on it. And when he gets to his count, he gives the dog a reward, right? And so the little rewards in this, uh, in, in this process for the puppy, uh, they get a little food reward every once in a while. But the big reward is the puppy's going to get to get off of the, uh, off of the shooting station and it's going to get to come out here and do fetching itself. So we're always working on the same principle, you know, access to the activity that you want to engage in through indirect action. The indirect action is uh, generally, you know, pretty simply defined. It's either being calm and attentive and waiting your turn or it's coming, being still and having good manners, maybe a little fetching or some of these Malinois here, maybe a, a little biting somebody that needs biting, but it's real simple stuff. Ranger, very nice. Oh, what a good dog. Oh, 
and I want to get excited. I'll get a little bit more excited. Oh my gosh, you're such a good dog. All right, now we're going to go down here and uh, we're going to give this dummy back to George and he's going to come up and uh, he's going to be my shooter and uh, we're going to actually introduce the little puppy to uh, uh, gunfire, right? And we're going to work on getting Ranger to stay steady until released so George's going to take the dummy launcher and launch the dummy I'm going to put a count on it then I'm going to let Ranger go get it and hopefully Ranger will bring it all the way back to me now if I can manage it if the little puppy's over there and stays calm and quiet every so often while Ranger's gone I'm going to reach over there and give her a treat we'll see what kind of multitasking I can do here <clears throat> now uh, integral to being able to multitask with a young puppy that can't stay still I know she can't stay still right uh, it's just impossible so what I've done is I've tethered her and so she can get up and move around but she can't get off that tether until she's calm and quiet again we're getting to the idea of everything comes through being calm and attentive and showing good work ethic all right now George what I'm gonna have you do is you're gonna go up there kind of about towards that tree there and you're gonna shoot your dummy uh, angle it really far up in the air and kind of shoot it towards the far corner of the yard but we don't want it to go too far now what you can do camera person is just come around here behind a little bit so that maybe you can see the young puppy and you can see ranger sit very nice so ranger sitting here being really nice and we'll give george the signal I'm going to put a count on it here. You see he wanted to break, and I, he's not going to get to break. Got to have slack in the lead. Slack in the lead, and I'm going to put a count on it. Let's say I'm going to put a 10 count on it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, look, I've lost it. Something came back and got him, a little sweat bee or something. A deer ticks, what that, a deer fly. Uh, but he go back. Let's see what happens. Okay. And we'll see what happens. Now, look, this little guy over here is being good. So I say I appreciate it. Now guys, listen, you're gonna have deer flies and stuff get you every so often. You can't worry about it. It just, it just happens. What are you gonna do? Oh, what a good dog. Come on, come on. That's a very fine animal. And I'm gonna bend down here so that he feels like I'm welcoming. welcoming. Oh, that's a good dog. Oh, click, treat, and release. Very nice. Okay. So let's try to give you a little different angle. Cameraman, come over this way. But what happened right there, when that dog, you know, when I was putting his count on him and that, and that deer fly came around to the back, you notice he wrenched around there and started to, to kind of, you know, to bite at that. A big mistake you would make right there, from my perspective, would be fussing at him. Right? A lot of times, like a dog does something, you know, you, you, you're trying to get him to look ahead and know where that, where, where that, where that um, a retrieving object has fallen. Uh, well, things happen. Dogs get a little distracted. Uh, you know, they get a little, you know, little twitch, a little pain here or there. And, and if you fuss at them, look, what you're really going to do is you're just going to kind of put a kink in your whole training session. Right? So unless a dog's at a high level of performance and really, really reliable, you want to try it as best as you can to keep the fussing out of your retrieving sessions. All right, so let's try it again. Can you get up there any more like this, cameraman? All right, so I'm going to move back just a little bit. So what I want the camera to be able to see is the puppy, it's the reaction. It's it to uh, the, the gunfire and uh, this dog staying still. I'll try to get over here so you, my shadow's not on him. Slack in my lead here, okay? And uh, now you notice that the little chocolate lab puppy Claire had no reaction. Ranger's being perfect. I'll put a count on it. I'm not gonna put such a big count on it. Maybe I went a little too far before. One, two, three, four, five, Ranger. And I'm gonna let him go. Now I'm going to give this little dog a treat. This is her little reward. Now remember, her big reward is going to be getting off her tether and, uh, and, 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 and getting to go do what she wants to do.
Now, Ranger's having a little bit of trouble out there, but I'm just gonna let him work it out. See if he can find it. Oh, there he is. And give him some uh, attention at the three quarters mark. Good boy, Ranger! What a good dog! Now I'm gonna bend down so I don't look like I'm gonna take his stuff or be uh, imposing. Oh, click, treat. Oh, what a good dog. What a fine animal. Very nice. And uh, I'm gonna bring him, uh, <coughs> bring him back into position. Make him sit and stay. Here you go, Georgie. Okay, cameraman, come back over here and get uh, from the back a little bit. Uh, maybe stay focused a little bit more where you can see the, the Claire's reaction. One, two, three, four, five. Ranger. Now guys, if he just runs straight to that and then straight back, uh, I'm gonna call that a wrap. That's what I'm looking for today. That's my session goal for today. Straight out and straight back. I'm gonna bend down, give him a little encouragement. Good boy, Ranger, what a nice dog. Get my treat ready. Oh my gosh, and my marker. Oh, perfect, click, treat, release. Oh, guys, and don't be afraid. Really, really, really fight the, fight the, fight the, your, your, your kind of your natural inclination is always going to be if you get a good one to do one more. But set your goals in your journal. And when, you know, if you get towards that goal, hey, look, call it a wrap. Leave the dog wanting a little bit more. Uh, this is a perfect session for me. This guy, he did pretty good. That first one, uh, you know, a deer fly got him a little bit. The second one, Took him a little while to find it. Third one, straight out, straight back. Listen, I'm not getting any better than that this session, right? So that's good. Three, three repetitions in the session where the third one's better than the first two. Hey, look, I'm, I'm super happy. And look at this little girl over here. She's perfect. She's been absolutely perfect. She got up a few times, you know, but all in all, she sat there, she didn't bark, she didn't chew on her leash, she didn't give me a hard time. So now I'm gonna take her off, I'm gonna put him on the tether, and I'm gonna walk around and just get some little retrieves in. All right, so Ranger, now you stay there. Oh, we'll move over here with Claire a little bit. Oh, and maybe get three to five reps in. Oh my gosh, it's a big thing for a little dog. That's very nice though. Oh, now if I wasn't making this video, I very well might stop on that repetition right there because this is a bigger dummy than what I usually play with with Claire. So it's a lot of work and uh, she went right out there and got it. But just to show off, we'll see if we can't get three. Oh my gosh, what a good dog. Oh, you can compete with those old short hairs easily, can't you? Very nice. And can you see what Ranger's doing over there, Amy? He's sitting there being calm and quiet. Calm and quiet. Put the play after the work. Oh my gosh. And there's my three reps. They were perfect. She went straight out, came straight back. She gave me the dummy uh, with perfect compliance. She is starting to really understand the relationship uh, uh, or the concept of mutually beneficial exchange. This dog is definitely ready to go out to the gorge or to go to the lake and uh, do some real life work. Very nice. All right, Ranger, and you did a great job too. Oh, very good. Now the work's over. And so you can go do some playing. Oh my gosh, you can go do some playing. That's a very nice dog. Very nice dog. And you're very nice. Alrighty, we're at the world famous Red River Gorge and uh, we're fixing to do some awesome environmental socialization with Claire. Uh, you can see a bunch of tents up there. Everybody's out here having a good time. If you ever get a chance, guys, you're anywhere near the great state of Kentucky, you have to come, bring your tent, 
and spend a few days in the Red River Gorge. I mean, it's just phenomenal. The people are awesome. It's great uh, climbing, great pizza. It's just, it's, it's just an awesome place to be. Come on, Claire. No, Claire, come here. Now, so you'll see, you see what Claire's done. Oh, it's right off the bat, she just goes and finds something. And all that is, just an old piece of wood, you know. And a lot of times when you have a young dog, you worry about them, you know, picking up stuff like this. That's why we're out here, guys. We're out here for her to learn what's a good thing to put in her mouth and what's not so good to put in her mouth. We're trying to get her to learn what different things feel like. Look, look at all these rocks. Rocks. These rocks are hard to walk on. It takes a dog a while to learn how to walk and, 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 and place their paws carefully when they're around a lot of rocks. And if you're taking a year old dog, a two year old dog, and you go try to go do some adventuring or you try to take them hunting and they've never been uh, uh, on a wet, slippery, rocky surface, look right here. See these, li these leaves? I've brought a million people down here. And I mean, every time I bring them down here in the fall, I got to watch them like a hawk because they'll fall down and break a hip, you know? Over here, <clears throat> all kinds of like stinky organic material and like this kind of rotten wood and stuff and there's and there's 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 worms and bugs and and deer poop that gets in here those are all things that are super interesting to a puppy and they need to learn to deal with that stuff while they're really young you know it's hard to learn lessons when you're when you're old that's why you really got to you know you really got to think in these terms everything a dog needs to know uh, needs to learn in puppy kindergarten so this is what our puppy kindergarten looks like we get out we get moving, we go on adventures, we stress the basics, you know. So I'm gonna put this long line on the dog because I don't want to micromanage her adventure. I want her to get out here and be able to have these experiences. I want her to get toes to nose stimulation. And uh, if she makes some mistakes, okay, she can make mistakes as long as those mistakes you know, aren't particularly dangerous. It's important when you're young to make a few mistakes now and again. So I'm gonna take off walking through this creek and you might say well stony why are you being a sissy why you got those boots on <laughs> well listen i'm getting old and whereas even in this november weather i used to would come down here in just my bare feet my shorts uh listen i just i i, I get stove up when i do that anymore so i'm just going to walk around out here across this creek dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. No, but Uncle Stoney has to be careful here too because uh, these rubber boots are slippery. Get a little current going. Get on one of these old rocks. So you have to be careful. Like if, if, if you're watching these videos and you're thinking about going adventure training, you better make sure you're in good shape. And one of the things you have to watch for, back on up there and show them, Eli. This is the kind of what, what I'm talking about, about looking... You learn to look for environmental impediments. Look at this, this old log caught up on the leash. I don't want that to make, uh, you know, to get Claire stuck out here, make her feel panicked or trapped. So we're just gonna move around. Dun, 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 dun. And Claire's doing pretty well. Oh. Now we're gonna walk on up the creek a ways ah, and see if we can't find a slightly different environment. Dun, 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 dun. Even in this one creek, like this looks like just one creek. Back up down there a little bit, Eli. You'll see where the water is not, where the water's calm, it's deeper. So that's where your dog's gonna to have to swim. But where the water seems to be moving a lot, that's where uh, the current is. And those are way different sensations to the dog. Those are things that a dog has to learn about while they're young. Dun, 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 dun. All right, so let's go over here. Now what I'm gonna try to do is find a spot on this bank where I can climb up and uh, Claire can climb up and I'm probably gonna to have to help her some, but remember guys, you help them. You don't do it for them. Here's a pretty easy spot it looks like. So I'm gonna go on up and that's gonna make Claire wanna come with me. And uh, then I'll probably use a little bit of leash pressure to help her if she gets stuck or she can't quite make it. Oh, come on little Claire. 
Oh, or I might just bend down. Oh, see how I just kind of push on the back of her neck? When your dog's trying to climb something, you can either stay behind them and kind of lift them just a little bit at their, at their hip, or you can just place your hand right here, and they'll put their paws up, and then they'll arch their head back. And while you're holding them, you give them some resistance, and they can pull themselves right up. Oh, you are smarty. Let's see if you can go over this big log. See, watch. I'm going to do it again. Right here. I don't have to really pull her. I just have to kind of help her. There she goes. Oh, you a smarty. That, that's a treat for you for that extra work. Very nice. Now we try to watch Eli, see if he can get up here without, <laughs> without messing up the camera because he is one-handed at the moment. And he made it. It's awesome. All right, so we'll take a little trip through the woods here. Now what I'm going to do, because when I'm in the woods, oh, Claire's not going anywhere too far. So I'm going to take this leash off of her so it's not getting wrapped around everything. Come on, little Claire. Get off of my leash. Get off of my leash. And we're going to take off walking over here and look for a cool spot. Dun, 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 dun. And so the same rules apply here as, a, as apply when we're out in my back training field. I just want the dog to stay relatively close. She can go explore. Uh, she just can't get herself in too much trouble. When she goes to go away, you'll hear me whistle for her. Or I might practice whistling every so often. Oh my gosh. What a smarty. Very nice. And we just take off going for a little hike. Now you're going to hear too. Remember I was talking to you about auditory socialization. Hear that? That's different. Oh, just the whole... The, the, show them out here, Eli. This environment on any given day is a tad bit different than it was the day before. So when you're socializing your dogs... Like you can take your dog to the same place over and over again if you just are uh, cognizant of the different environmental factors. Like is it raining? Is it cold? Is it hot? Has it been real dry? Because the weather affects how everything here feels on her toes, how everything smells through her nose, and how, you know, how everything sounds. I'll put this up to the microphone. You see that? You don't get this sound. Uh, in the spring. Ah. People focus a little too much, well a lot too much, on thinking about what a dog has to be taught, right? I don't like thinking too awful much about what a dog has to be taught. What I like to think about is how one can put a dog in a position of learning. You know, that's my job. I put them in a position where they can learn. Dun, dun. Whenever you start thinking about, like, you know, how fancy dog training needs to be, well, you have to remember dogs, you know, people have had dogs ever since caveman days. So how fancy does it have to be? Take off running. Oh, you're a good dog, Claire. Now this is beautiful. What do you think, Eli? Beautiful? Beautiful. Beautiful. Great day to be a working day. All right, now we're getting into a good spot to get out in the water and get a little bit of deep swimming practice with some current and all kinds of different smells and textures. Here we go. It's about the perfect dog training environment from my perspective. What do you think, Eli? Best. Best. Dun, 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 dun. 
Okay, look at this, guys. Look at this. Just doesn't get any better than this. All right, so let's get Claire. Oh, let's see if we can get her acclimated. See if we can get her acclimated. Now, Claire spent a lot of time in our little pool at the kennel, the one I bought from Mrs. Stoney. But uh, she really hasn't, other than right over there, you saw the first time she'd ever been in the water, you know, the real water, a real creek. But it looks like my yard work is paying off pretty well because she's taking right to it. Now, see, I'm just going to kind of come over here. Oh, see if I can get to a spot. Whoa! Y'all fixing to watch me. <laughs> Eli, we might have to trade positions. I might be getting too old for this part of the adventure training. All right, let's see. Now, this is pretty deep right here. So I'm going to get over here and see if I can get Claire to Oh, my gosh, look. That is so perfect. Oh, that deserves a little special treat right there. Very nice. And I'm going to go back across here. What I want her to see here, you'll notice how I've chosen a spot where it's deep in the middle and shallow. So it's like a, it's, it's, it's graduated on both sides. That way she can start walking. And then as the water gets over her chest, that natural buoyancy takes over. And she's like kind of still walking. That's where the dog paddling comes from. Then she dog paddles her way over there. And uh, then once she's over there, you know, I'll give her a little treat, tell her I'm happy with her, make sure her leash isn't caught on anything. And I'm going to walk back across the deep part. Now, it's not just a deep part, though, guys, because there is, there's current in here. So by choosing this spot, not only is she having to learn how to swim, but she's also having to learn how to swim and guide herself. Okay, and we'll just do this a few times. No pressure, you know. Not looking at her and really talking to her a lot. Just kind of letting her follow along. Oh, what a good dog. She's a smarty. Oh, very good girl. And again, that's a special treat. We'll walk up through here. Now, as it gets shallower, the current, the sensation of the current gets a little more pronounced. Her brain is having to process all of that and having to catalog her experiences. When you're young, your brain's wide open, guys. That file cabinet, it's wide open. And you can put things in each individual little, little place where it goes. The older that you get, man, that file cabinet starts closing and it gets harder and harder. That's why we do so much work with these puppies before they hit that adolescent period. We don't want them to be thinking about anything, you know, other than going out with their awesome handler and doing fun stuff. Dun, 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 dun. Now see, I'm getting into a little deeper water here. Starting to get a little bit more still. Oh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna head over here a bit. Oh, try not to get water in my waders. And Claire, I can't see her, but I'm sure she's just swimming right along behind me. And there she is. Awesome. Very nice. Now, I'm, I'm having a lot of luck here with uh, this long line on. And so you'd be tempted to take this long line off. But you want to, uh, like especially if you're out in any kind of water that has any current to it at all, you know, stick with your long line a while. Stick with your long line until you're 100% sure your puppy has got swimming on lock. Now we're gonna come up up here, go over a little bit of a sandy area. Oh, come on, nerd. And then back down. And then again, all we're doing is looking for sensations, different sensations. Right here, oh, let me pick up a handful. Remember there was rocks a minute ago? Look what we got here. See this little section here? It's just all dirty, rotten leaves and stuff. And so it smells really weird. I mean, it's a real strong smell. It's crazy strong smell and it's very slippery and your feet get stuck in it. Like my feet are really stuck down here in the silt right now, right? And those are things that, that the dog, like your dog, your dog might do perfect out there on the rocks, might do perfect on the sand. Then you get into the silt area and maybe they feel like uh, that's a little scary. Okay, that's fine. It can be a little scary. Just stay calm. Don't make over them. Don't treat them like they're babies. Don't treat them like they're fragile. You'll get it. Hey, come on. Come on, nerd. 
Come on. You can do it very nice. You walk through the silty area. Oh, it's so disgusting. It smells awful. Dun, dun. We go back to doing what we were doing. Now I'm going to get up here. Now that she seems to be real chill with the water, I'm going to get up here and maybe see if I can get just one or two repetitions of uh, fetching her little dummy uh, out in the water. And uh, I feel like right now, if I'm in this nice little shallow spot, oh, I can take Claire's leash off of her. Oh. So we're gonna take her leash off of her. Now, what I'm gonna do, just because we're kinda trying, kinda trying to stick with a common theme, is I'm gonna remind her that we're doing a little bit of marker training here. So I shared that click. She goes, oh, wait a minute. This is cool, I've heard that before. I know what's going on. So I'm gonna take her little dummy, and throw it in the water and see if she can figure out to get it. Oh my gosh, you were smart. And she's gonna bring it back over here. Oh, very nice, you were smart. Oh, very nice. And remember what we're working towards here is just mutually beneficial exchange. Let me throw it down here so, uh, is this a good spot Eli? Where should I get? I get over here on this side a little bit. Eli's always giving me little pointers back there. Eli's making the move into fancy video production level. All right, so we'll do it from this side. Okay, so I'm gonna throw it upstream a little bit. It's getting away from her. Oh, you're such a smarty. Oh my gosh, you are a smarty. Oh, you're the best little dog I've ever seen. Now, you saw what happened there, guys. You see what I was talking to you about the current, the sensation of the current? You know, this dog's been fetching this in my fetching pen and in the yard and in the back field. And then I throw it down here. She got it in the water over there. But then when I threw it here, like it kept trying to get away from her. Like she's going and she would try to pick at it. And the same time that it's getting away from her, like the water's getting deeper on her chest. You can see right here, she kind of has to swim a little bit. Don't get in a hurry on this kind of thing. If you get in a hurry on this kind of thing, then uh, like you'll end up, you'll end up getting frustrated and, and the dogs know when you're frustrated. Oh, come here little babies. Let's see if we can do it right here. Oh, fetch it up. Oh, you're such a smarty. Now look, see she decided she wanted to go over there and get out of the water. I understand that, that's no problem. Oh, you're a very good dog. Go back that way a little bit, Eli. Let's get here in the shallow, shallow part. Oh, you a very smart dog. You a very smart dog. Click, treat, oh, release, very nice. Oh, Jay, come here, little doggy dog. You a very nice dog. And we'll do one more. Remember, we keep our reps low with these young dogs. Lots of sessions, but short reps. Oh, what a good dog. What a good dog. You're the smartest dog. Very nice. Oh. And then we'll put the dummy away, leaving her wanting more. You always want to leave them wanting more when it comes to fetching. Uh, you know, you hear that, you hear that sometimes in life. You'll hear somebody tell you less is more. And sometimes it's hard to understand why. But anything that you get too much of, it's just not interesting anymore. Right. Folks, come on, come on. Oh, you're a fine animal. You're a fine animal, Claire. You're a fine animal, Ranger. You're a very nice dog. What you looking for? You gonna find you a bird out there? <clears throat> ah, what do I have in this pack? Well, let's see. I have a dummy launcher because we're working on, uh, you know, retrieving with Ranger, and uh, we're working on still working on sound acclimation with Claire in addition to retrieving. And I have a stake, and that's necessary. And I should somewhere in this bag have a hammer. Okay, so what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take it kind of back here out of the way. 
I'll hammer the stake in the ground. That way, when I'm working with one dog, I know where the other one is. Oh, sometimes around here, uh, we're down a man. My son, George, is usually here to help us, and uh, he does a good job holding the dogs, but uh, he's not here today. All right, so let me see. Uh, how about this? Come here, Ranger. Ranger, come here, nerd. All right, you got to wait your turn. You're going to go second. I got to go over here and show these fine people what I have in my pouch. Sit. Now you stay there. Okay, now, the point of this part of the video is to show you something pretty neat. I have a quail in a sock. I put it in an old wool sock like this so that I can get a lot of retrieves with it because if you try to throw a quail around or a duck around or anything like that, then uh, they just get up getting torn up and the puppies have a tendency sometimes to like grab them with their front teeth and pull feathers out and shake their heads. And that's what we were running on, running into uh, with Ranger earlier. Put it in that sock and it makes it a lot easier. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come out here and I'm gonna choose a path that's kind of beat down. Like there's some grass here but uh, it's not very tall grass because a four-wheeler's been through here. And I'm just going to throw the quail in a sock for Claire. She's going to go get it. Very nice. You very smart puppy. And she's going to trade it to me for a click, a treat, and a release. Okay. And uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to steadily increase the difficulty of where I'm throwing the sock. Okay. So... Uh, over here off of this four-wheeler path a little bit, you can see a little bit of a clump of grass. And so I'm gonna turn Claire around here where she can see it, and I'm gonna throw it in that clump of grass, make her wait a second, and let her go. She's gonna to have to go find it. Very nice. Oh, you're so smart. You're so smart. Click, treat, and release. Oh my gosh. All right, we're gonna get up here where we haven't been. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to throw this over here in this area where these things are a little taller and there's a big section of uh, dead grass right there. See if I can get it to where you guys can see it. Oh, come here, Claire. She's a very nice dog. I'm going to throw it and then let her go. And look at that. Dang, what a champ. Very nice. She brings it back for the click. Treat. Oh my gosh. And release. All right, there's my third repetition. Now, this is where the art of dog training comes in, guys. You should be satisfied with three. Three's great. If you double three you know, every month for a year, you got a lot of retrieves, right? Okay, now, if uh, you have an exceptional dog, you can do a little bit more than three. Back on up over there, Eli. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Like, progressively, the retrieving gets harder like the more that the dog can't see, the more that gets in the dog's way. Like, see right here? Now, you'd want to be careful. This right here, guys, okay, this is a briar bush. You wouldn't want to throw your uh, dummy or your quail into this briar bush because it would uh, obviously, you know, make a negative association with a young dog. Now, as they get older, you know, they can negotiate through that. But I'll come over here, and this is a pretty good area. Back up in this field here, Eli, and you'll see, look at this. See, this is like a giant barrier here for the dog. So I can position myself over here, throw my quail over past this barrier, and she's gonna have to bully through here to get it. And I think Claire, at her developmental stage, probably can handle that particular barrier. We'll see. But like I said, don't get in a hurry, guys. The fastest way to teach them nothing is to try to teach them everything at once. So I'm gonna throw it over the barrier. Okay, and see what she does. Oh, look, perfect. She went right through that grass barrier and started looking. Oh, very nice. Oh, very nice. Click, treat, release. And I'm not going to push my luck. That's four repetitions. One of the repetitions being a pretty substantial amount of grass that she had to dive through. So, hey, listen, that's awesome. That, that right there, guys. Even for a guy like me that does this for a living, that is plenty good enough. So if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you. Trade them out there. Uh, I put uh, Claire over there on the stake, and we're gonna go out here and uh, 
and, and work with Ranger. Ranger, get over there where you can see him, Eli. Let's see what Ranger can do. Oh, looky here. Now, Ranger's a little older dog, and uh, you know, all I'm trying to do right now is to get him to where he'll hunt for this. So, I'm not gonna be real structured. Oh, what a good dog, Ranger. Oh, what a good dog. Good boy. This kind of dog here, guys, he has all the talent that he needs. He just didn't have the right, or where the perfect, you know, early, early training. And so what I'm trying to do right now is come in and uh, make sure that he understands that this is fun stuff and we're going to have a good time. And yes, I expect him to mind, you know, but uh, like while we're in the, the drive development stage of this, where I'm really trying to get him just to love coming out here and going hunting and, and jumping through the woods and stuff, that uh, it's going to be primarily fun. So we're working on his obedience on one side and we're working on you know having fun on the other and then as his retrieving drive gets up and his obedience gets up then I'll start to put those two things together with the actual birds. Come on Ranger. All right back up there a little bit Eli. Oh. Very nice. All I want him to do is just go over there and look and see what he can find. He's got a great nose on him. And he'll get it in a second. Oh, what a good dog. Very nice. Oh, what a good dog. Click, treat, oh, release. Good boy. Okay, so now we're with Ranger. We've moved positions a little bit. Now I'm going to throw this uh, quail in a sock uh, over that uh, big clump of dead grass there where he's going to have to kind of go through a, you know, a, you know, a fairly substantial boundary from his point of view and uh, find the bird. So there goes the bird. Okay. And you'll see right there, you see he doesn't want to go over that. Okay, now what will happen is every time, that he does this, he'll get a little bit better at it. Oh my gosh, what a good boy. What a good boy. Oh, that's a good boy. Oh, that's a very nice boy. Very nice. Come here, buddy. Come here. Oh, it's a very good dog. All right, so let's, let's throw, let's throw our quail over this grass boundary. Okay. And right there he goes. He went right through it, doing fine. He's gonna hunt it up. Oh, very nice. Oh my gosh, you're just such a good dog. Oh, you're such a good dog. Very nice. Click, treat. Oh my gosh, a little bit of love and a release. All right, turn around here, nerd. Let's do it one more time. Let's do it one more time. Ready? Oh, that's about perfect. Very nice. Very nice dog. And you see how ginger, gingerly he walks through that brush and stuff? Guys, that will go away. He will get to where he just charges through there. He just didn't have that kind of environmental socialization when he was young. And so even though he's a big dog, you know, compared to Claire, like, you know, he hasn't had the amount of exposure she's had at her, her young age, uh, which is crazy. You know, again, sometimes you'll just expect certain things out of older dogs, but just because a dog's older doesn't mean it has a high experience level, you know? So we have to be very, very patient with a dog like this who's lived in the suburbs. You know, he hasn't been out here in, a, in what he considers a wilderness, you know? So if he's a little tentative going through the brush, if, if uh, he's a, a little bit hesitant to stick his head in a grass clump, you know, that's okay. We don't worry about it. We just uh, back up, make it easier, and, uh, you know, build on levels of success uh, through progressive improvement. You ready? I'll take that. I will take that every day of the week. Very nice. <laughs> oh, you a smarty. All right. Oh, he's a good boy. You see right there, a little bit gingerly, but that's okay. Oh, he's a good boy. He's a trooper. Click treat. Release. Oh, my gosh. All right. And that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it.